Hi, everyone. Oh. Uh, we're going to get started. Um, just feel free to finish up grabbing your food, but we want to make sure we get as much time with Luis as we can. Um, so just a first brief introduction. Um, my name is Michelle Cardona Minasco, and I'm a 3L here at the law school. Hi, I'm Avian Gressa. I'm also a 3L here. And with us, we have Luis Cortero Robes. Oh, my God. <laughs> Cortez Romero. Never mind. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Can we start with you kind of explaining your background and how you got involved in the legal field and kind of just your path um, to becoming an attorney? Yeah, and I guess before I start, I, as some of you or many of you know, I we had a Supreme Court case yesterday, so I'm like hot off that. I'm, <laughs> I'm slightly sleep deprived, so I'll try to be as coherent as possible, but uh, that is my um, disclaimer. So uh, if you're like, what is he talking about? Just blame it on that, yeah. <laughs> Um, also, I uh, thank you for the law school and for Amy and Michelle for bringing me here. Um, I am very appreciative of the space and uh, the interest in this case. So, um, yeah, so yesterday we had oral arguments at the Supreme Court regarding the rescission of DACA. Um, so we'll get into that a, a little bit later. I was one of the lead attorneys on the case, um, one of two attorneys on our side that uh, was helping present this case to the Supreme Court, uh, Ted Olson, um, who we will speak much about later, um, is the one who presented the oral argument and I was the one helping him out during that time and in the, the preparation, we were both at council table. And so um, uh, kind of with that backdrop, I, uh, so a little bit about me, I am also a DACA recipient. So this case means a lot because um, as I was talking to Professor Casper, and I don't know if he's, he's here somewhere, um, he, uh, you know, this case is very important because the justices ultimately would decide um, as not just because I'm an immigration attorney that is based out of Seattle. So they're going to decide ultimately whether my clients get deported and I get deported with them. And it's a, you know, it's a very important and personal case, um, but it's also very tough legally. And so um, knowing what's at stake, um, I think a little bit of my background, I was born in Mexico. I was brought to the U.S. when I was one year old and I grew up in California and I consider myself really a Californian. Uh, you might be able to tell by my purple converse, but <laughs> in the snow. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, um, so I consider very, myself very much a Californian. I grew up in the Bay Area um, and in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I went. I did my undergrad there at San Jose State. Uh, but immigration and immigration law has been a humongous part of my life, um, really, at, at many important junctures. Uh, when I was younger, I realized what it meant to be undocumented when I was in eighth grade. And uh, there was this trip to Europe that the eighth graders were going to take, uh, and we needed to like raise money for it. And we were going to sell chocolate, seized candy chocolate. Um, and so I hustled that chocolate and uh, was able to, to raise enough money to go to Europe. And so I told my parents, I was like, I have all this, I, you know, I, I fundraise a lot. And, th you know, that's, that was my first moment uh, confronting it where they said, you can't go. Um, and you can't go because you weren't born here. And I was in eighth grade. I didn't really understand the mechanics of it or why. I just knew that I couldn't go. And it was kind of my first confrontation with it. Soon thereafter, um, in attempts to try to legalize our status, uh, well, my dad started this immigration process and ultimately lost. Um, and to me, it, I, it, I couldn't, it still can't, wrap my head around someone who had no criminal history, has paid his taxes, had deep roots in, in the United States, uh, had worked two jobs, um, and was ultimately deported. And so uh, I've faced the immigration process um, as a person, not as an attorney, as growing up. Um, and then there are other tidbits that others might be able to relate with. You know, you need a social security number for almost everything. And so, um, including getting a driver's license. And so when I turned 15, I was like, oh, I passed driver's ed. I was so excited. It was like the one class I was paying attention to. And so, uh, and then again, you get hit with, you can't get a driver's license. And so it's just been a cycle that of, of snags and hurdles that, you kind of become aware of what it means to be undocumented. Um, and you also start to really ask what it means to be American. And so uh, it was uh, in 2010, I decided to go to law school. And law school wasn't in like my purview at all. When I was going to undergrad at San Jose State, I didn't even think about law school. Uh, quite frankly, I never, I didn't know it like, 
I never knew an attorney personally. And so I didn't think that was in the stars for somebody like me. Um, but someone suggested it, said, why don't you try going to law school? And so I looked it up and I took, I was like, what is the LSATs? Like, what is that? <laughs> and so um, I remember I like took, like I bought a book, like a Kaplan book, and I tried to do like the logic test. And I was so annoyed. I was like, what does this have to do with law? Like, who cares where the car is in the thing? <laughs> and so... Uh, um, so I took the LSAT and I started to apply in a lot of schools in California because I, who wants to leave the sun? And um, this is before DACA, right? And th I remember a time where, <laughs> not that I'm like super old, but I remember a time where uh, being undocumented was actually very scary. You know, there's, there is a whole slogan of being undocumented and unafraid. But I remember when I was undocumented, like a little afraid. And so um, it, the schools didn't know how to handle undocumented students. Um, they didn't know how to work with them by and large. And, you know, to no fault of the schools, it was new to a lot of people. But um, ultimately, when I got into several schools in California, I realized that there's no funding and that uh, being a DACA recipient, you're not eligible for financial aid. So I need to figure out how to pay this out of pocket. And as you may know, law school is expensive. And so um, ultimately, I uh, got into some other schools, including the University of Idaho in Moscow, Idaho. And um, it, what I realized that it was cheaper to pay out-of-state tuition in Idaho than to pay in-state tuition in California. And so after many discussions with the University of Idaho as to how to figure out a way uh, to be able to make this work, uh, we, I accepted it. And I, I accepted it before I went to go see what the school looked like. Um, so I thought it was going to be in Boise. <laughs> and so uh, I, and I had been to Boise before, and I was like, yeah, it's like the little city that could. Um, <laughs> and then I go to Moscow, Idaho. Uh, oh, my God. It's, just, it, it's, you know, and there's a different type of diversity, for sure. I come from California, and... I, you know, I was like, okay, um, now I'm in rural Idaho. So I, you know, I, I spent my time in Idaho, and um, after my first year in Idaho, um, again, we talked about, or I mentioned earlier about catching snags along the way and realizing what it means to be undocumented. I didn't even consider that being undocumented was going to impact my ability to practice law. And after, I remember it was Thanksgiving. Um, it was the first Thanksgiving I spent away from home because I didn't have enough money to go back home. And so I was in Idaho and um, I was looking into it and I realized that if you're undocumented, you can't take the bar. And so I was very bummed out. Um, I remember, it, so I, I, it was on Thanksgiving, it was on Thursday that I realized that. The Friday, um, I was already in Idaho with nothing to do, so I was like, I'm gonna retorts. And so I was on my way to the library and um, I called my mom and I let her know like, I'm dropping out. I'm in the middle of nowhere, Idaho. I'm like, it's, I'm hustling out here to try to like figure school out. Um, and uh, I, I couldn't afford books. So what I would do is at the law school library, they gave us like little cubicles for students. Um, and a lot of students would keep their books there. We had 24-hour access, uh, 24 access to the books. So I would go in the middle of the night and then read the books when people weren't using them. Um, and so that was kind of my study get down, right? Um, if I was there, I'm going to make it work. But it was quite taxing. And to not practice law, you know, is it worth it? Is it worth being in the middle of nowhere, Idaho? I don't know. So I called her and I was like, I'm dropping out. I was, you know, I'm not going to lie. I was very tearful. Um, I, had, I was so frustrated. And, um, and she gave me a talking to. She yelled at me pretty, <laughs> very sternly as moms do sometimes. And she told me, you know, you're not coming back here. You're staying there. Uh, because we don't, you know, you, we don't know if you're going to be able to practice law or not three years from now. But what we do know is, is that they can't unteach you what they're going to teach you. You're already there. Learn what they got to teach you because people don't make it there. Learn it, and then we'll figure it out later. I was like, okay, I guess I'm going to go. <laughs> uh, and so uh, it's also my first time, like, uh, having some relationship with snow. Uh, and so that was a trip. But I was like, okay, I guess I'll just tough it out. Um, so I did. But So I continued law school my first year, my second year, knowing that I wasn't going to practice law. And I had resigned myself to that. So I took opportunities where I could in school, right? I would do the clinics. I would do internships where I could to try to 
feel like a lawyer a little bit um, because I really just had these three years to do it. Uh, and in 2012, the, I just finished my two a year. People were talking about where they're going to clerk and the, you know where they're going to get jobs. And they had these trajectories that they were trying to work on. I'm thinking about the underground economy I'm going to join as I'm graduating. Construction, fast food, cash jobs. That's where I'm thinking I'm going. And so that's where I'm focusing on. And in the summer of 2012, I just finished my 2-0 year, going into my 3-0 year. So now I'm feeling like a big shot because, you know, 3Ls, because we are. <laughs> and uh, it was August where uh, President Obama had announced DACA. And uh, he, uh, through the announcement of this policy, he said, you know, that if you give them all your information, all of it, where you've lived your entire life since you've been here, your fingerprints, your photo, your birth certificate, proof that you had been there, where you've gone to school. They need to know every single little bit. And if you, uh, and then you, you know, you have to have provide a written statement as to why you want a work permit. And it's a, it's a, it's a whole thing. Um, you have to go into the ICE office, which is scary. You have to go into the ICE office and give your fingerprints. And there's this feeling of like, I might go in there and I might not get out of there. Uh, but, you know, they, they, it was a promise. And so we took the government at the promise. So I go and apply. And I, I remember I, was, I got my deferred action for childhood arrivals, DACA, granted. And it changed my life forever. Not only in giving me the basic building blocks that I needed for life, right? A social security number, ability to get a driver's license, um, that kind of thing. Uh, but it was a, once you feel recognized like that, and a part of the community, and you don't, you don't have to look over your shoulder. There's this feeling of, if something goes wrong, today might be my last day. Wrong place, wrong time, and you walk into an ice raid. And that happens. And, and so we, I mean, not to speak for everybody, but I, I know at least from other DACA recipients that I've talked to, it's a feeling that we share, right? That today could be the day. And you just live with that, and at some point you just carry it, and it's in your shoulders. And you don't, I didn't realize how heavy it was until it was taken from me. Once I didn't have to worry about that anymore, it, I, it was extremely liberating. And uh, I, it, it completely changed my perspective. Um, and, and I was going to be able to practice law. And so I remember I told my mom about it. She's like, I told you. It's like, I told you. I told you. I told you. She still says that. It's like, I told you. Uh, sometimes she'll text me randomly, like, I told you. And so, uh, so um, that was my trajectory into practicing law. And uh, what I knew in graduating is that I wanted to pr continue practicing. And I also know I wanted to get out of Idaho. That's uh, goal one, practice. Goal two, get out of Idaho. And so... Um, I ended up getting a job in Seattle, Washington, which I'm based out of now. My hope was to be in Seattle for a year and then, like, you know, go back to where the sun is in California. Uh, but Seattle stole my heart. And so um, I practice now immigration law. Uh, principally, I work with uh, immigrants who are detained. Um, and so we bring either challenges to the detention and the constitutionality of the detention, especially if they've been detained without bond for months or years. Uh, we work with asylum seekers, refugees, um, individuals who have green cards, who um, the government is trying to take them away for a variety of reasons. And so that is my, my get down now. So moving on to kind of how you, your process and getting engaged as an attorney representing DACA recipients um, began, I believe you were, um, you represented one of, if not the first um, dreamer to get arrested. So can you tell us a little bit about that experience? And I know you have a story you want to share. Yeah. So, um, you know, as I'm, as I'm representing clients, I don't necessarily tell them that I'm a DACA recipient because it's not about me. It's about them. Um, but sometimes they could tell as we're sharing stories and there's a certain level of comfort and trust that sometimes happens. Um, and if I build a strong relationship with a client, uh, you know, sometimes as we're talking, I, I'll bring it up, but I, you know, ultimately they're there for me to help them. And that's kind of where we'll leave it. In February, 2017, president Trump had just been elected and it just been right after the inauguration. And there was this question about what was going to happen with DACA. And by and large, we had this false sense of security. Now we know false sense of security, 
because he said, you know, we're gonna te we're gonna treat uh, dreamers with heart. Uh, the dreamers don't need to worry about it. He loves DACA and a whole bunch of other stuff. And so we weren't too worried about it. And on a Friday, I get a phone call from um, Tony, this guy named Tony, and he calls very distraught. And he's like, my brother and my dad just got picked up by ICE. Um, he tells me a little bit about the dad. You know, I'm not too worried too much about the dad. It seems kind of par for the course. I asked about his brother, Daniel, Daniel Ramirez. And Dan I asked about Daniel and Daniel, he's like, he has DACA and they arrested him anyway. And, uh, you know, he kept telling him I have DACA and they arrested him. And I said, this, it's a mistake. Uh, let's see, let's wait for him to get processed and booked and they're going to realize that they messed up and they're going to, you know, they, we'll talk about your dad later, but they're going to take Daniel. They're just going to like, let him go. Um, and so just be ready for that phone call to pick him up at, you know, where the ice office is. And so it got a little bit later in the afternoon and, uh, Tony called and he says, yeah, they're not letting him go. They're actually holding him at the detention center now. And I know that if someone's being held at the detention center, they're holding him at the, like they've, they've decided to deport this person. And so, um, I was Tony's like fifth call. Um, he had called other places around and because it was Friday afternoon, a lot of the attorneys were like, I'll go see him on Monday or come talk to me on Monday or, you know, you want something last minute, I'm going to charge you like a trillion dollars or whatever. And so, uh, so by the time he was kept telling no, eventually he called me and I felt for Daniel. Um, I imagine what it would be like to tell someone I have DACA and then just like, they don't care and they arrest you. And I started getting, I, I got a pit in my stomach. So I told Tony, like, come through my office. We'll figure this out. I'll go see Daniel at the detention center and then we'll figure something out. Um, uh, Tony comes talk to me. We have no idea why he's being arrested. And I ask about like, is he a gang member? Like, some, cause he has no criminal history. So I'm like, maybe they pinned him as like a gang member. Is he a gang member? And you know, uh, Tony laughed. He's like, no, he'd be the worst gang member. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, uh, so I'm like, okay. So I go talk to Daniel and he's right. He would make the absolute worst gang member. <laughs> uh, he's, he's very emotional. He's like, I don't know what to do. He's, he's just a very sweet person. Um, and uh, I ask him like, what happened? He's like, yeah, they, they, they looked at my tattoo and uh, he has a nautical star. That's like everyone's tattoo in California. And so, um, and he had his birthplace in Baja California Sur, which is a state in Mexico. Um, and he said, they looked at my tattoo and they kept saying, I'm a gang member, I'm a gang member, a gang member. And I kept saying no. And they just kept, and then they just took my DACA away. And as you may know, I'm also, you know, somewhat tattooed. And it's always been a, a real fear of mine of being Mexican tattooed and being labeled uh, or having my identity criminalized immediately. Um, and so again, I really felt for Daniel. I also knew what was coming down for Daniel without DACA. He was going to get deported for sure. And so, um, I remember I like, uh, it was a Friday. I eventually left the detention center Friday after, uh, evening. And I remember getting really emotional because I thought this is how DACA is going to end. They're not going to end the program. It's going to be death by a thousand paper cuts. They're going to detain people, put pretexts, and this is how the program is going to end. And we're screwed. I'm screwed. Um, and so I send like, I, like there's like Facebook groups and I got some Facebook friends and I, 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 I'm asking around to other attorneys to see if this is the new normal, right? This is right after President Trump's inauguration. I'm trying to see if this is happening in other places. I'm not getting much... Uh, like any kind of like receptive or answer. So I leave it. Saturday comes in and this like random lady on Facebook, uh, Anne, Annie, uh, sends me a message saying, hey, can we call you? I was like, who's we? But okay. Um, <laughs> give, 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 I give him my cell phone number and I get a call from this guy named Mark from Public Council. It's a uh, nonprofit based in Los Angeles. And he's like, I heard about your client, Daniel. Um, I'm interested. Can I, can I, I want to help. Can I help? And I said, sure, I don't know how we're going to help, um, uh, but sure. And so what I tell him, what I tell Mark is, let me try to investigate this more, right? And see what's going on. I only met with him one day. I want to try to do more research. Uh, and Mark says, okay, well, we'll talk tomorrow. Okay, I'll, I'll call you tomorrow. The next day happens on, on Sunday, and uh, I get a call from Mark. And he's like, hey, do you have time to talk about the case? And I said, yes. And he goes, good, because I'm in Seattle. And so <laughs> I just flew in from Los Angeles, and I'm here. Can you pick me up from the airport? Bruh, what? 
I was gonna like change the oil in my car. So uh, I'm like, okay, kind of annoyed too. Like that's very presumptuous. He's just coming out of here. So I pick him up at the airport and like I have to like Google to see who he is, to see what he looked like. I've, and so I'm like, okay, I see him. And so he like awkwardly gets in the car. And so I'm like, well, now what? <laughs> He's like, do you mind if we go to the detention center? I was like, well, I don't, okay, sure. So, so we go down to the detention center, we meet with Daniel. Um, and you know, Daniel is feeling very heartfelt. And I think he's, Daniel's, it's sinking in for him, right? Now he's two, three days detained. Daniel has a US citizen child who he's not seen. And they picked him up, in the, Daniel was sleeping in his living room where ICE went into his house without a warrant. Um, and Daniel was arrested within five minutes of waking up. I can't even make coffee within five minutes waking up. I can't imagine being arrested and having the whole life turned upside down, not being able to see your kid again. I'm not a parent, but I can imagine. And so uh, it's really sinking in for him. And so I, me and Mark talk to him and we're leaving the detention center and now we're back in my car and I don't know what we're doing now. And he's like, do you mind if I make a quick phone call? I'm like, okay, sure. And he goes, can we go back to your office? I'm like, I guess. And so, um, and so we're, now this is Sunday. We're heading back to the office and he's on a call and he goes, oh yeah, we're on the way to the office now. We'll see you there. I was like, who's we? <laughs> Who else is here? Uh, and so, uh, again, I'm a little annoyed. I was like, man, like my car needs some oil. And oil. And so we, uh, and now it's Sunday afternoon and uh, we make it back to my office and I meet um, this incredible attorney. His name's Ethan Detmer from the uh, uh, law firm Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher, which is a huge law firm. Right, it's a humongous, humongous law firm. Uh, they've been around since like 1890, something like that, right? So he's there and we're meeting in my small but humble office. And uh, we start talking about, I'm like, hi, Ethan, welcome to my Sunday. And uh, we talk about the case. And we're for hours talking about whether uh, the DACA program could be reviewable by the courts. And now we're talking about Iqbal and Twomley. And I'm like, what? I didn't think I was gonna hear this again. Uh, uh, so, so we're talking about these like doctrinal stuff and we're catching a bunch of snags and we're not like, we're, we're not figuring it out. And so Mark, the guy who came out of nowhere, he's like, let me make a quick phone call. And so, so he makes a quick phone call, puts it on a speaker and, uh, he's like, Hey, Erwin, I got a quick question. Do you mind helping us out with this? I'm like, who, who the hell's Erwin? Then I, I realized it's Dean Chimarinsky, uh, Erwin Chimarinsky. <laughs> and I start having like a fangirl moment. <laughs> I was like, he wrote the constitutional, you know, book, <laughs> Barbary, like, <laughs> wow. And so I, like, I recognized his voice immediately too, right? He has this like charming, but slightly nerdy voice. And so, um, and so, he, so we start talking through it and we start talking through it. And again, like we, we're on, we're, we're doing this for hours. Eventually it's getting late and we realize we're not going to bring this case. It, there's no way to get DACA reviewed by the courts. There's reviewability, there's justiciability issues. There's all these issues. Um, and we realize it's a no go. So we go have a quick bite to eat, say, our, I drop them off at their hotels. And then I'm like, okay, well, I'm not going to change the oil now. Uh, and so I just go back home and now I'm still bummed out about Daniel because I know what's coming down for him. It's now 11 p.m. and I thought my, I was like, this is a weird weekend. Uh, and I get a phone call from Mark and he goes, we, we figured it out. Like, <laughs> yeah, we figured it out. I think we got it, um, but here's the thing. We need to file like first thing. I'm like, okay, like file a lawsuit first thing, cool. Uh, and he goes, yeah, so we got to write this overnight. <laughs> I laughed, I was like. <laughs> Okay. And they were being serious. They're like, we're going to do this in shifts. We're going to have to put this together. Hold on. Let me, he said, hold on. Let me, like, let me plug you in. Plug me in. And, he, and now I'm like on a conference call with like a ton of other people. Uh, and he's like, okay, we're going to do this in shifts. And all of a sudden, like I'm being roped into this lawsuit. Um, and we get it together by 8 a.m. And I see like the council list and it's like me and um, Ethan and Mark. And I see Erwin Chimarinsky, Lawrence Tribe from Harvard. Um, and I start seeing all, the, all these other professors and, you know, all these people who are working on the case. I'm like, what is, this is a really weird weekend that's happening. <laughs> And so we file a lawsuit um, and uh, on Monday, and we just kind of leave it. Nothing's happening. And I'm living like my regular life now. Uh, come Tuesday, I don't know how it happened, but uh, one of the, I'm sure it was maybe through Pacer, one of like the dockets, uh, the, the Associated Press got wind that we filed this lawsuit. And because there's so many names on it and like there's Dean Chimarinsky on it and things like that, I think it got some attention. 
So we like my office started just getting like littered with phone calls. And somehow along the way, it, uh, uh, it was discovered that I also have DACA. And uh, again, this case wasn't about me, but it quickly became about us then. Um, and what seemed to be a bad case really ended up being an uncut gem. Uh, and then, so we worked intensively on this case. We got Daniel released from detention, uh, but now we're working on like, again, there's just disability issues. So it, can we review it? We're looking at the standard operating procedures for the Department of Homeland Security. We're like digging into DACA and this is the first of its kind. So we're the ones kind of doing this like lead work on it. Um, and so we're working on this case when DACA gets rescinded in September of 2017. So a few months later, but because we'd been working on this other case, Daniel's case so much, um, it's made sense to keep the team assembled and try to see what we can do. Uh, when DACA was rescinded, it was rescinded on a Monday, and we knew that the UC regions, UCLA, UC Irvine, UC Santa Cruz, like the UC system, uh, had filed a lawsuit, and so did the state of California. But what we realized was missing was the important component of the people who this is affecting, their stories. Because it's not just the DACA recipients, it's the community. We're talking about teachers and their students, doctors and their, and their patients, uh, you know, business owners and their employees. It's not just the 700, 800,000 DACA recipients. We're talking about millions of people being impacted by the rescission of this um, program. And, you know, as we have a lot of faith in the state of California and the UC regions, but those stories are not being told. And that is what's important, that our stories, the human story, is told. So uh, we, initially, there was talk about me being a named plaintiff on this case, but I didn't want to make this case about me. I wanted to work on the case. Um, and I wanted to be on, the, you know, making these decisions, not just be the name of it. So I respectfully declined, but I said, I'll get you other DACA recipients who can get on this. Um, and it was harder than I thought. Most people didn't want to do it because putting your name out there, putting your stories out there, putting your parents' names out there, it's scary. Um, but we got six brave people who said, I'm in. And when I called them, I was like, we need to file right now. So like, I need an answer like in an hour. <laughs> so, uh, um, and so, uh, by Wednesday, we got, uh, so they, the decision to rescind happened on Monday. On Tuesday, I think, is when the state of California and the UC regions filed. On Wednesday, we had gotten our plaintiffs and got declarations together and kind of put the suits together, like the lawsuit together, and we filed by Thursday. Um, by that Monday, uh, we uh, were told we need to be into court in California. And so uh, now we're in, in the Northern District Court uh, in California, uh, alongside with the UC regions in the state of California, uh, helping to fight the rescission of DACA. And uh, what sets us apart is that we're the ones telling the stories of the people. Now, California is saying their own interest and why California is going to benefit from it. But we want to make sure that the judges and the justices know the real impact that's going to happen on people, not the states, on the people. If, this, uh, if the government is permitted to rescind this program in the way that they did. Um, and so from there, that's how I got involved in this program. Uh, and, you know, I've told this story a few times and someone described it, and I think it's kind of funny, of like going to a baseball game, catching a foul ball, and then you get invited to play to the Yankees. And so, uh, and so um, but what was interesting, you know, there's so many lawyers there. And um, I'm the one who practices immigration law on the regular and has really lived with this. Uh, so there was moments where we had a hearing of, you know, trying to figure out the Immigration Nationality Act, which is a very confusing and nonsensical act. Um, and I was the only one who knew it inside and out. And so although there was these other like partners and, you know, they're like in their 50s and 60s, here I am at that time, just my late 20 year old <laughs> going in there and uh, presenting to the court on a very important case. Um, and so I was able to argue in front of district court and I feel very uh, proud to do that and knew that I uh, had the expertise to do that. Because once you live with this problem, you, can, you become obsessed with trying to solve it. And so I have read every bit of that INA um, and try to figure out a, uh, you know, the solution that's not really there. 
And so, um, and as we're moving forward, that's an element that seems to be missing from the case that I get to provide is not just the, like the immigration perspective of like, this is how it works mechanically. This is how it works in, in practicality. This is how it works in theory. And this is how it works historically, right? Programs like deferred action has gone back at least since the Eisenhower era. The first person who got deferred action was John Lennon uh, from the Beatles. And that's an important history to know that you may not know if you're walking into this for the first time. And so the synergy on the group was amazing. We were able to work really well together. And as it kept, the case kept advancing forward, you know, the, um, you know, the more that we will continue to work on it together until eventually it got to the Supreme Court. Um, and then that's where the arguments were yesterday. So segueing to the case at the Supreme Court, can you talk a little bit about um, the oral argument that happened yesterday and kind of your impressions about it? Sure. So, and just to be clear, you may already know this, I'm sorry if I'm being somewhat repetitive, but the, the basic argument on the court and, and the lawsuit is, is that when a administration, a government administration like the Department of Homeland Security is going to rescind a program or change policy, we're not saying it can't do that. Obviously, they can do that. But there are rules. There are things that need to be considered. If you're going to end a program or switch sharply, switch uh, policies, you need to make sure that you do your homework. What's the cost of this? Uh, why are you doing this? Uh, um, is, you know, it, it's seeing that you took everything into consideration. And, and if you still come out the same way, fine. But there is part of the Administrative Procedure, right? The Administrative Procedures Act, for anybody who's taking Adam in law, uh, is there's, there's this process that you have to go through. The problem is, is that the, the Trump administration has, the, they said that the reason that they ended this program is it was because it was illegal. It was an illegal program, and so that's why we ended it. So what they're saying effectively is that they have no choice but to end it. They don't want to own the decision and saying, hey, this is like a crap program. We don't want it. Uh, you know, F the dreamers, and we want to end this program. That would be a different case. But they're saying, I'm sorry, everybody, we have to end the program. And so there was a question about whether is DACA legal or not, because if DACA is legal, then the reason they rescinded the program is flawed. And if the reason that they were sent to the program is flawed, then they didn't do it right. Um, and there's also, you know, the that was initially the lawsuit. Then later, months later, they uh, issued a second memorandum called the Nielsen Memorandum uh, with Secretary Nielsen, then Secretary Nielsen, who then said, oh, okay, well, okay, okay. I, I, you're saying we need to show our homework. Um, well, you know, it's illegal, but... If I had to rescind it, I'm rescinding it because I don't think it's a good policy. But it doesn't say much else, right? It doesn't talk about the $4 billion that it's going to cost the U.S. down the road. Um, the impact on the economy, the impact on families, the impact on employers and businesses and universities. Um, it doesn't take any of that into consideration, and it needs to. And so the question here is, is whether the rescission of DACA and the way that it was rescinded was proper, uh, and so there's, there's, I mean, kind of gets slightly more complex than that, but that's the gist, right? And so, but this case is broader than that because it's not just about DACA and the Department of Homeland Security. What if the EPA made a decision, uh, sharply turning the other way and it just says, we're doing this because whatever reason or no reason, um, uh, can it do that? Uh, and generally this case is really just about the rule of law. Can an does an administration have to follow their own rules and show their homework if they're going to change policy? Uh, and if they do, how much homework do they need to show? That's the question. And so uh, we were expecting, um, you know, a, a, a hot bench. We we're expecting the, the Supreme Court justices to uh, ask a ton of questions. And surprisingly, they didn't. And so we were a little worried about that. We're like, what does that mean? Um, also... Uh, at the Supreme Court yesterday, the, the, what we thought were the friendlier of justices, as you can imagine, Justice Sotomayor, Justice Ginsburg, Justice Breyer, um, Justice Kagan, the, uh, we thought you know, that they would fall in, within the reading of the way that we were reading things. Um, but they were asking you know, quite pointed questions at our side. And it's hard to, it's really hard to say how the justices are going to come out or are thinking based on the questions that they ask. Because it could be a question that they're asking because they really don't know and they want to answer to it. 
or it could be that they're playing the devil's advocate, or sometimes, as you may know, the justices ask questions to you to communicate it to the other person. And so it's hard to say, and it's hard to come out to say like, oh, we think we're going to lose because they asked us hard questions, or we think we're going to win because they didn't ask us that many hard questions. The press is already starting to say that, like, oh, the Supreme Court justices seem to want to end DACA. It, that's reading tea leaves, and, you know, if you want to go that way, fine, but it's just as good as, you know, we're having a crystal ball. And so um, it's hard to say. We thought that we were well prepared with all of the, our answers, that we anticipated all of the, the questions that are going to be asked, and, uh, I mean, we spent a ton of time on it. Um, and uh, so we think it, we, we're feeling confident, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's hard to say. But what we do know is, is that if this administration is able to rescind DACA in the way that they did, is that future administrations or this administration is going to be able to abruptly change policy in any other type of administrative uh, agency with no reason or with a pretext and no one can do anything about it. And it's not just this administration, right? We're talking about future administrations too. Um, it, it's, so it's important. And the thing about administrative agencies is, is that it's not like we vote them in, right? No one voted for Nielsen to go in there. No one voted for the Secretary of State to go in there. No one votes for these people as part of the executive branch. So there needs to be some level of accountability, political accountability. If you're going to make a decision, you got to own it. You can't just hide behind some pretext and say it's illegal. That's our argument. Uh, and then if the, tell the public. Tell the public, this is why we're doing it. If you don't like it, vote. But they can't, they're not even doing that now. So this case is broader than just DACA. I mean, it's impacting millions of people, but this, this, this uh, case is about what administrative agencies need to do if they're gonna change policies. So we're excited and nervous to uh, hear the results. So can you, <clears throat> excuse me, tell us a little, bit, a little bit about the days leading up to, and then just the general feeling at the courthouse. Um, for example, we know there were people that were walking all the way from New York to DC to be there. There were protesters and demonstrators all over the streets. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the experience as far as like what the day of and days leading up to were like? Yeah. So the day leading up to the argument, I mean, you're debating things on such a granular level. It's really annoying um, in terms of how to frame it. And it's important, but it comes down to you're like arguing as to whether you say it this way or that way. Um, and uh, so we spent hours and it's like all day talking about it. And debating about it and debating about it and debating about it because you want to make sure you pressure check what you're saying, um, at least in our context, in the immigration context. And then we wanted to make sure that we are collaborating and sensitive to the wider immigrants rights movement. Um, that was very important to us. So the framing of the argument is important. I'll give you an example. I think it's often said, particularly about dreamers and DACA recipients, that, uh, you know, they came here through no fault of their own. Uh, but then there's a question of like, well, who fault, whose fault is it then? And it pins the parents against the dreamers. And so it was important to us to make sure that we are following the larger immigrants' rights movement and not do that and make sure that we frame our argument in a way that not just reflects the interest of our clients, but other, the other hundreds of thousands of DACA recipients who are around. So the framing was important. Um, what Anticipating the best answers to the questions, because sometimes there's multiple uh, best answers. And so... Um, making sure you're looking at case law and you're remembering that case law. So it's, it's a lot of granular level thinking. Um, and as we're going through the Supreme Court uh, argument, um, the way that, you know, the, my contribution to it was just not, not only like looking at the mechanics at the history of the immigration part of it, but also making sure that I am representing what the larger immigrants' rights movement has been doing the last few years and making sure that that's represented in the court. And so oftentimes uh, during our moot ended up being me and Ted Olson, uh, who is, uh, was a former solicitor general for uh, George W. Bush. He argued the case, good Bush versus Gore. He also did Citizens United. It's a bit of a controversial figure, um, but you know, staunchly known as a Republican. And now he's, you know, uh, advocating on behalf of DACA. And so oftentimes Ted and I would get into these conversations about like, no, we got to do it this way. And we may, I'm sure we're going to frame it that way. And I was insistent about it. Um, eventually where he said, you know, you have to sit next to me at the council table. Um, and I was like, oh, I clutched my pearls. I was like, me? <laughs> uh, I was like, me? Uh, uh, you know, but then I got, that means I got to be on it, right? I got to be on it because this isn't just like a favor, you know, that's being done. It's, it's the, 
you know, the wider contributions. And so I also knew it was important and I was very glad because um, it would signal to the other DACA recipients that, you know, we are being represented at this table and to the justices that if they're going to permit this program to end, then they, do they need to look at us and tell us and see the face that they're going to impact. And so, um, I don't know if you've ever been to the Supreme Court, but it's surprisingly small. And so, um, it's like when you're sitting there, uh, it's, it's, it's less than me sitting here in the first row in terms of where the, the justices are. It's really, 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 really short. So, you know, you're able to see all of the justices as they're there and they're able to see you. Um, and so, it was very important for us to, to have that outside of the court strategy too, to make sure that the DACA recipients know that, you know, this, this is a fight for them and by them. Um, and so leading up to the court, you know, it was a lot of just like prepping for that. The day of the argument uh, was amazing. And it was a strong reminder of what got us there. There was a, a march from New York to DC uh, in support of DACA. And they got there on Saturday or no, on Monday, the day before the argument. And they, uh, you know, it was a large crowd there and, was, you know, it, it made, it made us energized. We met them there, but then the day of the court, I, I, it was hard to tell how many people were there. I, you know, I would say it was like about a thousand or more of people there, uh, of just people chanting, a lot of, uh, activists, a lot of, uh, protesters trying to make sure to message that, you know, this is a, an important program. And it reminded me about what brought us DACA because it's important to know that DACA wasn't just a gift from Obama. It was a concession made by the administration after a heavy political or a heavy activism push. Um, there was, a, Obama had talked about immigration reform and all these things, and it was activism sitting down in his campaign office his second term when he was running in the second term and shutting his office down in Chicago that ultimately led for him to meet with the individuals who were demanding some sort of protection for young people. And DACA was the brainchild of young people that was proposed to President Obama and the secretary. Um, it, it, he didn't just come up with it on his own. It was brought to by activism. And it's important to know, historically we have seen, that it's always activism that leads and the law that follows. And so seeing all those people there reminded us what got us there in the first place, is this activism and the energy and putting yourself out there to make sure that you were taking up the space and that we're being seen. It was an amazing feeling. Um, and to know that I was benefiting from those who got me there. Um, and so it was quite emotional, I'm not gonna lie. It was very emotional um, to see the community there. And I think that's also a good measure of, to see of, you know, how you measure of things happening. I know there's a lot of bad things happening now, um, but uh, it's the community reaction that I think it's important and the, the, the counter that we see um, that I think is a true measure of kind of where we are. So it's a, it's a very overwhelming feeling, um, a very emotional feeling. Uh, so we want to give the audience a chance to um, ask a few questions. So I'm just going to ask one last myself. Um, is there anything? <laughs> um, <laughs> is there anything you want other dreamers who might be listening to know? Yeah, that, you know, uh, things seem tough right now, and they are. But from what I've learned from my experience is that what – you know, we, we have to persevere and move forward of what we can't see yet. And we have to keep, you know, we have to keep each other um, safe and that we have to make sure that we're sticking together as a community to make sure that we're achieving our goals um, that may not seem attainable yet or that, you know, they may not see, we may not see them in somewhat in the, in the near future. And my personal experience with that was almost dropping out of law school. Things seemed really bad then. Um, seem, things seem really tough then. Uh, and I'm glad I stuck it out because, um, you know, the, the community does have our backs and it, it will come to a fruition, but we have to keep pushing. And so, um, you know, to make sure that the spirits are held high, your heads are held high, your chest out and that we, we handle it because that's what we've done and that's what we'll continue to do. Thanks so much, Liz.
Um, so we have just a couple of minutes, but if anyone in the audience has any questions that they'd like to ask. You know, in terms of Alito's history on this doctrine, um, he has essentially has a history of, of having the wide executive power. And I think that that's what he's thinking about. Um, one of the things that I think really solidifies for us that we don't think that Alito is going to go our way is, is how the census case came out. Um, the census case came out is, is very similar where there was this action done and then this kind of like justification later for it. Um, that seemed to really bug Chief Justice Roberts when that was discovered that the rationalization was kind of like a pretext. Um, essentially, the, the opinion was like, lie better next time. <laughs> and so, um, but uh, Alito, uh, uh, sorry, Justice Alito uh, wrote a dissent on it. And so it kind of gives us a sense as to where it was. It, it, I, I thought there was going to be more questions from Justice Alito the day of the court. There wasn't as many as I thought there were going to be. They weren't as pointed as I thought there were going to be. I, again, I'm reading tea leaves. So, But uh, going into how justices have voted in the past doctrinally, it, it doesn't seem like Justice Alito is an, a vote that we can count on. Though the strategy always is to convince everybody. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, did that answer your question? Uh, yeah. I think uh, the feed, we weren't sure, but the feedback that we got during the moots was that that's a question that Chief Justice Roberts is really going to have, is whether DACA is ultimately legal. Because if DACA is illegal, then their justification makes sense. Um, somewhat. I mean, they didn't really explain it, didn't do their homework, they just kind of got, got lucky. And so the court might then end up uh, holding it on that. Uh, I think they're going to have to wrestle with it. Uh, and I think it's a question that's likely that's going to have to be answered. Um, Alternatively, because we also thought about like, like, what do we lose, right? We want to make sure that if we lose, we're not losing in a way that uh, will handcuff the admin future administrations to do this, a DACA 2.0 or whatever. So alternatively, if we're going to lose, uh, what we're hoping is, is that they'll say this is a, an administrative action, an administrative decision that cannot be reviewed by the courts. And that's why we're not going to even decide on it. If that's true and there's a future administration that comes in, and they make a DACA 2.0, then what the win that we've kind of gotten is that someone like Texas won't be able to challenge it later and review it because it's an agency action that can't be reviewed. So, you know, Texas is a bit of a weird case, uh, and it, it definitely it was relied on heavily by the government. Um, I think the decision to start a program is different than the decision to end a program. That's Encino Motor Cars. Uh, and so... Um, so I think it's the reliance on it is somewhat misplaced. The government also said that because DACA was only for two-year increments, that the reliance interest on DACA was short and small. Um, and so that, that way, they don't even really have to give it much consideration. I think that's a lot of BS, to be honest. But um, the that's you know what they premised it on. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's it's a bit hard, you know, the to, to to balance that because a lot of the time, uh, I'm trying to not make this about me, and so I'm looking as I'm looking at it as a lawyer, I'm looking at it from a doctrine perspective, I'm looking at it from a legal perspective, you know, and I need to make sure that I'm keeping that balanced because I don't want my passion for it to cloud like what's going to be the best argument or what's not going to be a good argument. So sometimes I have to disconnect myself from it uh, in order to 
make sure that I'm looking at this objectively and then have people I can rely on. Hey, this is what I'm thinking. Am I having rose colored lenses on? Or, you know, is this a bad case to take on? Um, but it does get somewhat heavy um, to, to know that you, what your client is facing and, and what you're working for has a very real impact on you. And I will say, interestingly enough, in my day to day, I practice immigration law and I go to immigration courts and it's oftentimes where my clients and I walk in there. Um, and it, where, what strikes me and where I really start feeling like undocumented or having DACA or not being a full legal permanent resident is when we win cases. Because my client and I both walk into court undocumented. Only one of us walks out with status, and it's not the attorney. And so, uh, and I'm very happy for them, but I feel it. I feel it when we win it. Like I'm, I hope to get there one day. Um, and so, it's 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 uh, it's a it's a lot to grapple with, you know. And it, it goes to show, you know, m mental health for lawyers, I think, is very important. Um, and I think it's more so for anybody doing this type of work in immigration law and even more so when you have personal stakes at it like this. Uh, I'm not the best example of that, but uh, I strive for it. Did that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that's all we have time for, but thank you all so much for coming. Thanks, Luis.